All right, we'll get started in a few minutes. There's some files on Blackboard. One of them is a ZMAX file. Let's go ahead and download those. What you hear in the background is my wife finishing up with a student that she's working with. Has the mechanics midterm been graded yet? Hmm. Are there any other midterms coming up? I think e &M had one last week. And not sure what else. I don't know what the, I guess there's astrophysics. All right. We've got how many people here? We've got nine students. We'll wait for a couple more. And then I want to go over something in ZMAX. And then we'll continue with wave optics. Um, professor, I have a question, um, yeah. something about ZMAX. I should have asked you this instead of um, about echidnas. Um, how do we interpret it? Uh, how do we interpret um, the RMS versus field graph? Uh, I know I kind of understand how it's a measurement of wavefront error versus um, change in angle and the Y direction, mm -hmm. but wavefront error doesn't necessarily correlate with image quality right well the larger the wavefront error wavefront error is basically another way of saying um do all of the paths take the same amount of time to get from a point on the object to a corresponding point on the image and if they do then you um can say that there's zero wavefront error but you could also do RMS spot size versus field. So I could do RMS versus field here. And I'm mildly surprised that it's covering such a small range. Um, it should be, I've got three, I've got some fields. Well, let's first show spot radius and then why let's give this non-zero weight and see what happens i don't quite understand okay there it goes. So um, we could look at this as the spot size. Um, if we were to send in, uh, if we were to look at objects that are at different distances off axis, this would be the spot size versus the off axis angle. Um, if we went with a uh, wavefront error, wavefront error would be better if you're close to the diffraction limit. Um, yeah, it would be better if you're close to the diffraction limit. Um, 
but we're not close to the diffraction limit here. So it's not going to be as useful. Spot radius would be the more useful thing. It's got a much more literally visible visual interpretation. Uh, one more minute and then I'm just gonna get started. One way, an interesting bit of completely non-physics science trivia. Did anyone hear about the weird microorganism that they found in a lake in Switzerland, the one that, that uses nitrates instead of oxygen. So at the bottom of a lake in Switzerland, there's very little air, um, very little oxygen. There's plenty of oxygen in many bodies of water because waves on the surface and wind and everything result in lots of air bubbles getting into the water and then diffusing around. And so that's how fish breathe and how lots of other things underwater breathe. But the, um, that's how photosynthesis happens under, uh, no, sorry, that, yeah, that's how photosynthesis, it's not oxygen, it's CO2. That's how CO2 gets into water and gets to algae. And um, at the bottom of this lake, there's a layer, this very thick layer with extremely low oxygen, but high concentrations of nitrates, which are a nitrogen and oxygen compound that's highly reactive. And so what these little microorganisms do is that they use nitrates to burn their food. I mean, metabolism all comes down to taking food and combining it with something highly reactive that will cause a reaction that releases energy. And then you use that energy to do things in the body. That's all that metabolism is, all. I mean, it's the most important thing in biology except maybe reproduction, but it's, um, that's what it is. And so, okay, so they do that. So they burn their food with something other than oxygen, except that these are, these are eukaryotic cells. You know, there's three types of cells, three big domains of life. There's eukaryotes, which is us and other animals and plants and fungus and algae and all the complicated cells. Then there's bacteria, which you know about. And then there's something called archaea, which are a little bit less common, a little bit more obscure, but still very important in ecosystems. And they kind of sit halfway between eukaryotes and archaea. Well, eukaryotes like us, we have mitochondria which are basically once upon a time, they were bacteria that crawled into the cell and then they stayed there and became completely integrated into the cell. So we have mitochondria and they burn sugar for us. That's their job, they burn sugar. Um, well, these microorganisms are eukaryotes, but instead of having mitochondria, which use oxygen to burn sugar, they have some other kind of bacteria that took over in their cell and that bacteria uses nitrates to burn sugar. So they basically have their own kind of mitochondria in there. Really fascinating stuff. And at this point, I'm just gonna get started with optics. Oh, the paper's available, the paper on that is in nature and it has some cool fluorescence microscopy images. There, that's the optics time. So one thing I probably should have done is I should have given you a trick for, um, designing a best form lens the easy way with a specified focal length. I'm just gonna let you get away with object and image distances and say that, well, if the object distance is infinity, then the image distance will be about a focal length. That's more or less true, except that really you should be measuring it from the principal plane. But let's talk about a way we could do that. Um, what we could do that when you're trying to specify the um, focal length of a lens is on the second surface of the lens, instead of typing in a number for the radius of curvature, you can type in the element power. Let's say we want something with a 40 millimeter. Is this in millimeters or centimeters? It's gonna matter because, yeah, that's in millimeters. Something with a 40 millimeter um, focal length. Well, the power is one over the focal length and one over 40 is 0 0.025. Okay, so we've just specified, we just told it 
but that's what the focal length needs to be. So what it will do is it'll look at this radius, it'll look at the thickness, it'll use those relationships we worked out in matrix optics to figure out how the uh, focal length is related to the radii of curvature, the refractive index, and the thickness of a thick lens, and it'll calculate what this radius needs to be. Well, okay, fine. That's one way to make a lens with 40 millimeter focal length. But of course, I could have chosen a different number for this. There are lots of numbers that I could have chosen that will give us a 40 millimeter focal length. And so how are we gonna figure that out? Well, you can make this a variable, okay? You can make that a variable and just say, we're gonna let the um, optimization tools figure out what that radius should be. But now when we try to bring something to a focus and we've got a focal length of 40 millimeters, we know that the image should be about 40 millimeters away from the lens, but it won't be exactly 40 millimeters away from the lens um, because the distance, the 40 millimeters would be measured from the principal plane. And the principal, the pr principal plane location varies. If I change, this um, radius of curvature, and I do a quick focus, my image plane moves. And you're thinking, okay, the image plane moves. Well, isn't the image plane 40 millimeters away from the principal plane? It is indeed 40 millimeters away from the principal plane. But the principal plane move, different lens shapes have slightly different principal plane locations. This right here, which is, 39.29 millimeters away from the last surface of the lens is indeed 40 millimeters from the principal plane and the principal plane is 0.71 millimeters inside. Conversely, when I redo the focus, this point here, which is 38.76 millimeters away from the back surface of the lens, it is also 40 millimeters away from the principal plane. It's just that the principal plane is 1.24 or whatever millimeters inside the lens. And you're thinking, how could the principal plane be 1.24 millimeters inside the lens when a minute ago it was 0.71? Any guess? Don't overthink it. The location of the principal plane depends on the lens shape. So here I have a more curved less uh, left left surface. Sorry, a less curved, more curved. It's twenty. Here I have a less curved left surface. And if I make it more curved, way more curved, like that. And I do a quick focus, then it changes yet again. And now the principal plane is 3.29 millimeters away because it's 36.71 millimeters from the back side of the lens. It's three point, sorry, so it's 3.29 millimeters from the back surface of the lens. So the principal plane is actually somewhere out there. Okay, so principal plane location depends on the shape. Well, that means that the object lens distance will also depend on the shape. So we better make that a variable for Zmax to play with, All right? We'll make that a variable. And then we set up an optim, uh, we set up a merit function. Let's have it minimize spot size. Arma spot size, um, hit apply, close. And we have it run and comes up with a very different shape 
this shape. And now we have a best form lens for an object at infinity and a focal length of 40 millimeters. And the object, the, sorry, the lens image distance is 39.09 millimeters. So it's less than one millimeter off. So if you just went for a 40 millimeter, um, 40 millimeter image distance, you were pretty close. I'm giving credit this time. But if you really want to be precise about it, this is how you would do it. Any questions? Any ideas on how we would verify that this is indeed um, a, a lens with a focal length of 40 millimeters? Because the object, sorry, the lens image distance isn't gonna tell us that. The lens image distance is only approximately 40 millimeters. Um, professor, you said focal length? Of 40 millimeters? Focal length, yeah. How do we verify that the focal length is 40 millimeters? Well, one method is we could um, graph a y um, equals f tan theta and then get a slope of f. Oh, yep. Yeah. So I would just look at um, all fields and I would see that the thing coming in at three degrees forms an image 2.08 millimeters off axis. I would go into Mathematica and I would say F equals um, 2.088 divided by the tangent of three times pi over 180. And I would get something very close, but of course we've got some spherical aberration in here. So we shouldn't be surprised that the image didn't form quite where we expected it, but it formed close. We should get better results if we decrease that. All right, now it's 0 And it's getting closer. And then we could go down to, one thing you should know is that this lens, although it has less spherical aberration, still definitely has spherical aberration. I mean, it was optimized, but it wasn't that optimized. 0.070. All right, and it's probably, now that's a little bit high, but remember 0.07 is undoubtedly rounded. Any questions on that? Based on the fact that it's within the airy disk, um, what can we say, based on the fact that the spot diagram falls within the airy disk, is this lens aberration limited or diffraction limited? Think about what we discussed on Tuesday. Is it diffraction limited? It should definitely be diffraction limited. And if we go to the diffraction and circled energy graph, we see that indeed the um, the um, graphs line up pretty well, not perfectly with the diffraction limit predictions, but pretty closely. And that is a fairly good lens, at least for this aperture. And yeah, it's a pretty wide aperture. We've used up almost the entire lens and we've gotten really, really good um, diffraction limited performance. Any other questions before we move on?
Okay. Then let's recap what we did with wave formulas and go farther with wave formulas. So we said last time that we were going to be writing waves in this form. We were going to be writing them in the form of some amplitude times the cosine of kx minus omega t, except that instead of writing in terms of cosines, because adding up cosines is difficult, we would write them as the real part of a e to the i kx minus omega t. And this is for a wave with a wavelength given by lambda. It's related to k via 2 pi over k equals 2 pi over lambda. And it has a period t related to omega via 2 pi over the period. And then c is omega over k because that's 2 pi over t divided by 2 pi over lambda. The two pi's cancel. 1 over 1 over lambda is lambda over t. And so the speed of a wave is wavelength per cycle. All right, well, that's the speed in vacuum. But one thing we've been talking about since the first day of class is that light goes slower inside of glass. Inside of glass, V equals C over N, which means that either lambda or T or both must change. And it turns out that it's lambda that changes. Lambda naught is the wavelength in vacuum and then lambda is the wavelength so you replace lambda with its value in vacuum divided by N. The wavelength gets shorter because it covers less distance in each cycle of oscillation. So K is two pi, well, lambda naught over N, and that one over one over N is N. So we get N two pi over lambda naught. People usually write this as N K naught where K naught is the value of K in vacuum. Any questions on the notation? Then let's talk about the physics. Let's talk about why it is that lambda changes instead of T. The best analogy I could get involves um, rides at Disneyland. I'm guessing most of you have been to Disneyland or some other kind of amusement park, and you'll be on these rides that are on a continuous cycle. It's not like a roller coaster where the whole thing stops while people get off. It's those rides that just keep going. And when you get to the area where you disembark, then the ride slows down but doesn't stop moving. And when that happens, all of the cars get closer to each other. Before, when you're going through Space Mountain or It's a Small World or whatever, um, you're pretty far from the car in front of you and you're going fast. And then when you get to the area where you disembark, you're going slow and everyone's bunched together. Now, you could think of these cars at the ride as a periodic phenomenon, honestly not so different from a wave. You've got one car passing through however many seconds. You've got one car loading however many seconds, one car unloading however many seconds. It's a nice steady rate. If the rate at which cars were unloading were larger than the rate at which cars were loading, then at some point the ride would have no people on it, which would make no sense because you're unloading people faster than you're loading them. So what's really happening? Conversely, if the cars were loading faster than they were unloading, then eventually you'd have a bunch of people trapped there. But you've got this nice steady state behavior 
just as many people getting on as getting off. Well, it's a bit like that with the arrival of a wave at a surface. Light waves carry energy. We know that light waves carry energy because they can make things heat up and they can drive chemical reactions in our eyes and they can make currents flow in our cameras. So they're carrying energy. And when light arrives at a surface, the rate at which peaks are coming in, the number of peaks coming in each second, it better equal the number of peaks leaving each second. Otherwise, you'd either destroy energy somehow, which makes no sense, or you'd get this huge pileup of energy at the surface of the glass, and eventually the glass would melt. So in order to avoid those paradoxes, the period of the waves has to be the same, both in air and in glass. And if the period is the same, then the wavelength is going to change so that things can move differently. Likewise, at the ride, well, on the one hand, we have to keep the period the same. But on the other hand, we definitely need to slow down so that people can board and disembark the ride. And so we change the speed, we change the spacing of the cars, which is like the wavelength because the cars are a repeating phenomenon, they just go around, and we change the wavelength of the light. Any questions on that idea? So we usually write this as E equals the real part of E naught E to the I N K naught X minus omega T, where E naught is just the value of the electric field at the peak of the wave. It has both a magnitude and a direction because like we discussed last time, if this is the direction it's traveling in, we've got an oscillating E field, which is perpendicular to the direction of travel. and an oscillating B field. And most of the time we will talk about the E field because magnetic forces from light waves are usually negligible. And yes, there are exceptions. Usually when the magnetic forces are important, it's because energy levels, atomic energy levels with different um, angular momentum and hence different magnetic moments are, um, have very different energies. And so then they can interact with magnetic fields and that becomes really important. Okay. Any questions on this notation? We call these plane waves. Not plane with an AI in the case of boring or simple, but plane as in planar, as in flat. And here's why. We call them plane waves. Because if we were to look and ask ourselves, where is this field a maximum? It would just be in a plane. I mean, let's do a really, really simple case. Let's say that E is the real part of, I'm gonna do X, y, z out of the page is the real part of z hat e to the i times two pi x minus omega t. At t equals zero, where are the peaks of this? Where does e, where does the z component of the electric field, which is the only component it has, 
have its largest magnitude. What's the real part of a complex exponential? Let's think of it that way. We've got this complex exponential in here. What's the real part of it? Cosine. Cosine. So this is just z hat cosine of the 2 pi x minus omega t. So our E field is coming out of the page. So where, if t is zero, where does this expression have maxima? Uh, integer values of x. Yep. So x equals zero, one, two, three, et cetera. Okay, so does it matter what the value of y is? Like if we were at say no. x equals one, y equals 73.9, is it a peak? Yeah. Even if z is minus 27? Yeah. And again, if x is one and now y is, I don't know, minus pi and z is equal to 2.718. Is it a maximum? Yeah, I still have a maximum. Yeah, so in this plane, x equals one, everywhere in that plane, oops, I drew it the wrong orientation. Everywhere in that plane, we have ourselves a peak. That field is at its maximum absolutely everywhere in that plane. And over here at x equals two, again, that field is at its peak everywhere in this plane. So in these planes, which in this example we did very conveniently are numbered by integers, in these planes, E, Z is a peak value. And that's what it means to call it a plane wave. It means that if we were to look for a surface of constant electric field, then that surface would be a plane. Everywhere in that plane, E would be at the same point in its cycle. And now a little bit later, T equals 0.1 one over um, omega, oh, 0 0.1 times two pi. Well, no, we'll just say 0 0.1 over omega, leave it at that, okay? So now E is equal to Z hat cosine of two pi X minus omega times 0 0.1 over omega. Now, where are the peaks? Or how do we figure out the peaks? When the input to cosine is an integer value of two pi. Yep, the input to the cosine has to be an integer multiple of two pi. So two pi times some integer that I'll, which I'll call m. So two pi x minus 0 0.1 equals two pi m. Divide out the two pi, x equals m plus 0 0.1 over two pi. Looks like our plane got shifted a little bit. Not much, but it got shifted. It looks like this plane get, got shifted. And if we were to draw another plane where there are peaks, that plane would get shifted. And if we drew another plane where there are peaks, 
in turn, that plane would get shifted. So all of these peaks, all of these places where we see peaks would just get shifted. That's what it means to say that this is a plane wave. Now here's the thing, a true plane wave doesn't exist because a true plane wave is infinite. I said that at least initially at t equals zero, that we have a peak anywhere that x equals one, two, three, four, yada, yada. And that's true whether y and z are 0.1 or whatever, or whether y and z are 10 trillion, okay? We could have y equals 10 trillion trillion, way far off from the x-axis, and it would still be a peak. All right, so here's our x-axis, and anywhere that we go, any distance that we go from the axis in this plane, we still have a peak. Well, of course, in the real world, we can't go infinitely far from the axis and still expect the light wave is at the same point in its cycle. We can't even expect that that wave has a measurable amplitude. It's probably decayed off. Any real light wave has a um, finite width. Nonetheless, I claim that even little laser beams, like the one that this cheap desktop uh, laser pointer produces, that even this thing is uh, producing something that we can approximate as a plane wave for many experiments. Any guesses as to why that's a valid approximation? So a laser beam. All right, it is going to be really intense. Well, actually I'll draw it like this. If I were to draw in a plane, here it's really bright. Then it gets a little faint but you can still see some light. Then here it's even fainter. So bright, somewhat faint. And this is roughly maybe two millimeters. And I'm claiming that for a beam of visible light, two millimeters might as well be infinity or at least for many purposes, it could be approximated as infinity. For visible light, two millimeters. The key words are visible and then some number with units of length. Why is it that for something that's visible, two millimeters is a really big number? It's really big in comparison to what? Is it in comparison to the wavelength of the light? Yep, because lambda for red light is around 630 nanometers or 6.3 times 10 to the minus seven meters. Whereas two millimeters is two times 10 to the minus three meters. So two times 10 to the minus three over six times 10 to the minus seven is 0 0.33 times 10 to the fourth or about 3,300. So this is thousands of wavelengths wide. So if I were to shine the beam on something significantly smaller than a millimeter, which we often want to study in science, maybe we want to study a cell, Maybe we want to study a molecule. Maybe we want to study some microscopic device like in a computer chip. If I shine that light on something way smaller than a millimeter, well, I've got a light beam that is thousands of wavelengths apart, thousands of wavelengths across. And so thousands of wavelengths across is basically infinity. 
So we model things that are to us in no way plane waves as plane waves for many experiments. On the other hand, if I was interested not in what's happening in say one cell or one microscopic particle that I shine it on, but I wanna talk about a beam of light propagating in space, well, a two millimeter beam will spread out. We know this because if I shine my laser pointer on my desk, it's a few millimeters across. And when I shine up on my ceiling, it has expanded a little bit. And when I shine it to the other side of my house, I run into the problem of picking out a tiny speck of red light from across the room while the house is still lit by daylight is difficult, but I've done the experiment before and it's definitely spread out a little. So it all depends on what you're trying to model. If you're trying to do um, an experiment on scales much larger than the beam, well then of course the beam is not infinite. It's not a plane wave. If you're trying to do an experiment where things, the things that are illuminated are much smaller than the beam, then indeed you could treat the plane wave well, you could treat the beam as a plane wave. Any questions? Really, all this notation is just perfectly clear. This is as clear as the best BK7 glass ever. This is as clear as anything that my friends at SHOT have ever produced. This is so clear that we could build LIGO detectors out of it. Well, the detector itself would have to be absorbent, but you know what I mean, build the lenses and the beam path out of it. Okay. We've been writing down formulas for a wave that's going in the X direction. But in real life, waves don't just travel in the X direction. Waves travel in all sorts of directions. So let's talk about a wave that is traveling in some other direction like this. So here's X. Here's y, and this is the direction the wave is traveling. We could start by calling this the x prime direction, just to get a formula written down. And for completeness, this would be y prime. We could say that e is equal to e naught real part of e to the i times n k naught x prime minus omega t. So all we're saying is that while it's traveling along this direction, the formula for the wave involves the coordinate along the direction that it's traveling. But of course, the coordinate along the direction of travel, well, let's see here. I can write, if this is rotated through some angle theta, then I can write this in terms of, um, I can write x prime in terms of x and y. x prime is equal to x cosine theta, plus y cosine of 90 minus theta. Which is equal to x cosine theta plus y sine theta. So then I could say e is equal to e naught the real part of e to the i 
n k naught cosine theta x plus n k naught sine theta y minus omega t. Any questions on how I wrote that? Oh, and I just realized this is wrong. 90 minus theta is just that. Sorry about that. Anyway. Hmm. I've got some constants times cosine theta and some constants times sine theta. This kind of looks like the X component of a vector. And this kind of looks like the Y component of a vector. And indeed we'll say that we've got a vector K. We'll call this KX and this is KY. And K is a vector that's in the wave direction. KX is N K naught cosine theta. KY is N K naught sine theta. What's the length of K? Better use what you remember about vectors to figure out what the length of k is. The square root of kx squared plus ky squared. Yep. Square root of kx squared plus ky squared. I've got a n squared k naught squared in both terms. I can pull that out. And the square root of that is just n k naught square root of cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. And that's one. So the length of k is n k naught. And the direction is the direction that the wave is going in. So we get e to the i kx times x plus ky times y minus omega t. Huh, what does this thing look like? I got the x component of a vector multiplied by x plus the y component of a vector multiplied by y. What does that look like? It looks like a vector. It looks like a what? Like a vector. It's not a vector. A vector would be something like this. Okay. It would be a component multiplied by a unit vector plus another component multiplied by another unit vector. But we don't have a unit vector here. We have a coordinate. Right, and really I should be putting, I've been doing this in 2D, but really I should be putting the Z components in as well. So the vector R is the vector from the origin to a point in space. The x coordinate is just the distance along the x axis. So here's our origin. Here's r. Here's x 
y, z. All right, and so this is how far along we go in the x direction. This is how far in the z direction. And this is how far in the y direction. So x is a coordinate. And a vector component. It's a component of the R vector, the vector from the origin to whatever point in space we're measuring this field at. I still have the question what does this look like? It's not a vector, but it is something involving vectors. Oh, is it the dot product? Of the yes, the dot product. And really I should have put plus KZ times Z. So what we finally have here is that E equals E naught, the real part of E to the I K dot R minus omega T. And this is how people write out plane waves. When we go through all these leaps, these layers of notation and abstraction so that we don't have to write out as many things. So we don't have to say Kx times X plus Ky times Y plus Kz times Z. Um, we do it so that we don't have to write out two pi over lambda. We do it so we don't have to write two pi over the period. And we do the complex exponential just because that way it's going to be much easier to add waves. It's easier to add exponentials and factor out common things than it is to uh, write out sines and cosines and add those. In fact, here's what often happens. We have several waves coming in at a point in space. So here's a K1, K1, the K of the first wave, and there's a bunch of peaks along it. Here's K2, the K of the second wave, and there's a bunch of peaks along it, and they're gonna add up. And so we've got E1, e to the i k1 dot r minus omega t plus e2 e to the i k2 dot r minus omega t. Um, well, the nice thing about exponentials is if you're adding or subtracting things in the exponent, then you can factor them out. You can do real part of E1, E to the I, K1 dot R, E to the minus I omega T, plus E2, E to the I, K2 dot R, E to the minus I omega T, and then people say, you know what, if we're adding up two waves at the same frequency, which we often are, because often people are doing experiments where, you know, maybe you illuminate a lens with a beam, it's the same wavelength of light everywhere. And then all these things are coming together. So you got all these waves coming from different parts of the lens. They've all got the same omega. They just get tired of writing out e to the minus i omega t, and they get tired of writing out the real part. So they leave those out and they're understood. And instead they just write e1, e to the i k1 dot r plus e2, e to the i k2 dot r. And they just don't even bother to put that in. You, will, you can open up any optics journal today and you will see that. And if you're very, very lucky, the author might say somewhere, the e to the minus i omega t dependence is implicit or has been suppressed or will take the real part at the end. Otherwise, they just assume you know that for the same reason that in Spanish, 
someone just assumes that if you say the, ver the verb tango, that the subject is yo. You don't have to say yo tango, you just say tango. Well, it's the same thing in math. It's a language and certain things are so common that they just leave out these notations. Any questions? Well, K is telling you the direction that the wave is going in. So before we take a 10 minute break, let's open up the Mathematica file that I posted on Tuesday. Wave animation it's called. So go ahead and open that. And once you've got it open, just hit shift enter and an animation will start. Um, I don't know why my animation is starting and stopping. Um, it shouldn't be doing that. Mathematica sometimes runs slow for me, but just hit shift enter again. And you're able to play with the wavelength and you're able to play with the period. And if you make the period longer, it goes slower. And if you make the wavelength longer, it goes faster. Conversely here, If I make K larger, well, K is two pi over the wavelength. So if I make K larger, what should happen to the wavelength? Does it get bigger or smaller? Don't overthink it. Smaller. Smaller. Yep, that's a larger K. And the reason why the amplitudes are no longer the same is because it's not sampling finely enough for some reason that I don't really, I should be able to make this. All right, now if I make it larger than um, the graphics resolution, ah, Jesus Christ, Gil. Oh, Melinda, me. Uh, me. So my grandfather would say when he was angry, he wasn't allowed to swear in English. So he would swear in Italian. The result is that the only Italian words we know are the ones that grandpa said when he was angry. All right, now, if we go down here, this one will probably not work at all. Here we've got something where you can vary kx and ky and omega. Right now I've got so that kx is two pi, ky is zero. But if I make kx and ky the same, and this thing doesn't completely break down, which it sometimes does, because why wouldn't it? Then you see how it starts going in a diagonal direction? Kx and Ky are now both positive. So it's going up and to the right. And now if I can, ah, Jesu Christ, Gio. Well, usually if I mess around with it enough, then it just 
completely forgets what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, I'm trying to show that it's traveling in the direction of K, but I don't know about your computers, but for some reason, Mathematica is running slow on mine, even though it's a brand new laptop. Any questions? Everything I've been saying here just makes perfect sense. Somebody must have a question. All right, let's take a 10 minute break. I'll see you back at 610.
Okay, so back. Um, like I said on Tuesday, if you really want to go in depth with wave optics, you take the wave optics class. But we need at least some amount of wave optics for this. And so it's good to develop an understanding of the kinds of symbols we'll be using. Therefore, I want you to go on to Blackboard and um, under today's files, you should see a, um, an activity on waves. And it asks you to um, do some things that are a little more elaborate version of what you did on today's practice homework. And I'm going to break you up into uh, several groups for that. So let me create some breakout rooms. Um, I'm gonna disconnect my other device so that it doesn't get assigned to a room. All right, I'll create three breakout rooms and I want you to work on this for 20-ish minutes, give or take. Try to understand these formulas. E I E I to pi. X minus T. X. X minus T. Okay. For one, we could just simplify it. Um, 
we could just like distribute this. I was thinking we could just distribute this and then take the real part of it and then like turn it to cosines. But um, yeah, what do you guys think? Yeah, that looks right. Yeah. So then we could do, uh, okay, uh, let's see how to do this. times or we could actually just make it like this like draw like a little parentheses like that and then we could just make cosine of that i think that's might be easier cosine this minus t well, I don't know how if this is worth it for you or not, but um, I like to split that up usually. So I have like e i two pi x times e i or well, negative i two pi t, and the reason I do that is because um, the time thing will be the the time will be tell me how big the amplitude will be. So it's one to be at the biggest peak at the uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. That the small being here got me nervous. <laughs> Here's the issue. Oh, no, no, I'm just, the way I write it, I usually write it a little bit different. So I have like cosine two pi X times cosine uh, two pi T. You have cosine times cosine? Yeah, so one, one of them- Why uh, do you have cosine times cosine? One of them is for the spatial frequency and the other one's for the temporal frequency. Right, but why do you have cosine? I mean, you're right that we could write that as E to the I two pi X times E to the minus I two pi T. But the real part of the product is not the same as the product of the real parts. That's, that's covered in a class called Math Methods. Um, I'm not sure what idiot taught it last semester. I should probably go yell at him if he screwed up teaching that. <laughs> so it's not cosine times cosine. I see, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. If you want to factor it, then it's going to be something more complicated. It's going to be cosine times cosine minus sine times sine. But as you have it like this, the, the, the form that you have it in right now is actually kind of nice for figuring out where the peaks are because the cosine function has a peak whenever its input is 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, etc. So it just really comes down to the question of whether x minus t is an integer or not. Professor, I just realized, weren't you, <laughs> didn't you taught math about this last semester? <laughs> I don't like remember, cause like math methods was like, you know, like a long time ago, like, like somebody taught that class last fall, but like, I don't know, was it like me? It did yeah, feel it, it did feel like a long time ago. Actually, I don't know why. Yeah, well, yeah. We're in a strange <laughs> time right now. But yes, the point is that the it's not cosine times cosine. Let's just focus on that and move on. Okay, let's. See. I forgot what the question asked. Okay, it's just okay. I think that's good. How's it going in here? Uh, not too bad, Dr. Small. We're, um, we're around four, I think, four or five, if I'm not mistaken. Is, uh, it, for two and three, it, it's at a peak for all of the points, right? Yes, it is. OK, cool. Yeah, that's, that's what I was wondering. Yep.
Any questions in here? Not yet. Okay. I think we're good. We're on six right now for the first one. Okay.
All right, let's check in on the breakout lows again. One is point one. If we the lines again, where the amplitude of electric fields. Okay, so it's asking uh, if at T is equal to point one, if it shifts the line, basically. Oh, oh this is getting crowded. Do you guys mind if I erase some of this? Uh, Any questions for me? Uh, yes, I don't understand uh, number four. In which part? Oh, part one. So the x-axis is going to be x or? Yeah, t equals zero is either component of e a peak at all integer oh, values. No, I mean five. Uh, five. five. Okay, yeah, I should clarify that. So I should really be saying connect all of the value, the cases where x equals zero, and then all the cases where x equals one, and then all the cases where x equals two. So there's going to be several vertical lines? Exactly. OK. And the y-axis will be the, um, it will be the e. It can be e of z or e of y. They're the same thing, so. They both peak, yeah. They both peak there, so. OK. I, mean, I, I uh, didn't understand what was being asked. Yeah, I should have clarified that one. I'm gonna clarify. I'm gonna edit that for next time. Anything else before I go to another breakout room? Um, professor, I'm sorry. Can you clarify that again? So you're saying that for the vertical axis is, uh, or at least the x axis, um, it's the x position. Or it's x position. I'm saying that the peak, the location of a peak, only depends on the x coordinate. So yeah. if I've got a peak where the input to that function is one, two pi times one, then connect all the points where the input is two pi times one. Then connect all the points where the input is two pi times two. Then connect all the points where the input is two pi times three. Okay. So like, let's say this is like if the horizontal axis was E of Y, right? And, and all I'm trying to say is that all the, is that X e, at, if X equals zero, no matter what the value of Y is, you've got a bunch of peaks. If X equals one, no matter what the value of Y is, you've got a bunch of peaks. That's all I'm trying to say. I phrased it poorly on there. But all uh, I'm trying to say is this. Okay, okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my favorite subreddit is explain um, like a five-year-old. Um, yeah, that's why. Well, this, this is the five-year-old concept. This is, <laughs> look, let's just move on. We know what the issue is now, okay? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Um, Any questions in here? No. I think we're fine, Professor. Which part are you on? Uh, second part on my site. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. I'm going to check in on another group. How's it going in here? Pretty good. Good. Any questions for me? Uh, Not that I can think of. This. All <laughs> right. All coming back. <laughs> all right. What part are you on? Part 3A. Oh, good. Good. All right. I'll check in in a little bit. We'll probably do this for about another 10 minutes and then I'll wrap it up by going over what, I, what the key points were. Awesome.
Okay, I'm gonna call my students back. All right, we have, we still have a few people missing. Still waiting for two people. Okay, what we're going to do, since we just have a few minutes left, I wanna go over what you should have found. What you should have found is that if we look at the points where say, the input to the cosine function is zero or the input to the cosine function is two pi or four pi or six pi and so forth, in the first case, they're just vertical lines. And as you increase time, they move to the right. Because in the first part, k was just two pi x hat. I might not have written a two pi x hat in there, but we had cosine of two pi x minus two pi t. So two pi x must equal kx times x plus ky times y. And you might say, well, I don't see anything involving y in there. Well, that must mean that this is zero. And we know that y isn't zero everywhere. Y is only zero at certain places in the plane. So ky must be zero. So kx must be two pi and then k must be kx times x hat plus ky times y hat plus kz times z hat, zero, zero, um, and so that's two pi. And so this wave is moving in the direction of k. Any questions on the first part? I know I phrased a few things a bit ineptly in that. Then the second part, which you should have found, is that now the surfaces of constant input to the cosine or constant phase, that those surfaces are diagonal. And they move this way, which is the direction that K points it. Did you find that? Did they may not get that in the second part? Uh, I, I didn't get that. What'd you get? Something wrong. <laughs> okay. So what you should have gotten is that um, we've got two pi times X plus Y equals two pi times an integer. That's when we get a peak. So then x plus y could equal zero or one or two or three, et cetera. Well, here would be the case where x plus y is zero. Here would be the case where x plus y is one. Does that make sense now? Oh, yes, that, that does, thank you. Good, so then, if we just increase the time a little bit, 
we got two pi times x plus y minus t equals an integer times two pi. So x plus y equals an integer plus t. So as we increase the time, this shifts a little bit because now x plus y has to be a little bit larger than zero. This shifts a little bit because x plus y has to be a little bit larger than one. And this shifts a little bit because x plus y has to be a little bit larger than two and so forth. That's what you should have found in the second part. And then finally, if you did, it's, it's a little bit of a tedious geometry problem and some trigonometry, but if you do it right and you find the spacing between these, you should find that that spacing is two pi over the length of K because the length of K is two pi over the wavelength and the wavelength is the spacing. So in part one, K is two pi X hat, length of K is just two pi, lambda equals one. In the second part, K is two pi X hat plus two pi Y hat. So the length of K is, well, I'll simplify this by writing as two pi times X hat plus Y hat. So it's two pi times the length of X hat plus Y hat or two pi square root of two, which is two pi over lambda. Cancel the two pi's and lambda is one over the square root of two. Any questions? Okay, on Tuesday, we're gonna talk about a few more cases with waves, and then we're going to start talking about interference and adding waves. And then next Thursday, we'll talk about diffraction by slits and square apertures so that after the break, we can talk about circular apertures, which matter for lenses. Have a good weekend. Have a good one, Professor. Bye.